Hey, Grace Bible Church family, uh, we're now to the ninth chapter of Mark. Today's, the date for this devotional is March 26th, Thursday, March 26th. And we finally made it to the, the climax, the high point of Mark's gospel, right in the middle of it, the transfiguration of Jesus. And I'm just going to read uh, verses 2 through 13 first, and then we'll come back and talk about them. After six days, and this is six days after Peter's confession of Christ, which we looked at yesterday, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Um, this is the passage that definitively shows that Jesus is God Himself. This is the passage that uh, Arians, who deny the divinity of Christ, Unitarians, who deny the divinity of Christ, just can't deal with because it's so clear. Uh, first of all, Jesus begins to radiate the glory of God. He, he opens up His humanity somehow, some little bit. He pulls the curtain back and the very glory of God shines through. And by the way, the reason why, the, uh, as we'll see when we get to chapter 14, the reason why Jesus is condemned to death is not because He claimed to be the Messiah. We've got to get that straight if we're going to understand who Jesus is. The Messiah was a human being anointed by God, and in the Jewish thought of the day, the Messiah would be this political military leader like we talked about, we've talked about several times over the course of this devotional, who would restore Israel to the glory that she had under the Davidic monarchy. The Messiah was a human being. Jesus claiming to be the Messiah wouldn't necessarily have gotten himself killed because the religious leaders in examining him had to at least say, maybe he is the Messiah because after all he is a man. What got Jesus killed was his claim to be divine. And if you, we're skipping ahead a bit, but Mark 14, uh, 61 and 62, the, pre, the high priest is examining Jesus, and he asks him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Okay, so he's asking him one question. Jesus in 62 says, I am, yes. But then he says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And so Jesus kind of, you know, races past the Messiah thing and says, you don't understand, not only am I the Messiah, I am God Himself. And that is when we see the, Pharisee, the, uh, the high priest tearing his clothes and, you know, they're throwing dust in the air and they're going nuts and they're saying, we've got to kill this guy now because he claimed to be God. But His divinity is very clear. If it wasn't already clear in His baptism, and if it wasn't already clear in all the miracles He's performed, it's certainly clear in His transfiguration. Second, we see in verse 4, Elijah and Moses are there with Jesus on the mountain. Somehow they appear, they appear with Him. Have no idea how uh, that works. Have no idea what that tells us about uh, life after death. I think this is probably a special exception and we shouldn't try to make any rules for what life after death is like based on Elijah and Moses appearing on the mountain. But the point of them being there is this. The law and the prophets testify that Jesus is the Christ. Moses represents the law, the first five books of the Bible. Elijah represents all the, all the prophets of Old Testament Israel. And together, 
they come on the Mount of Transfiguration and they, they testify by their presence that Jesus is the one who um, is God's anointed one, that he is the one prophesied about all through the Hebrew Scriptures. And whereas Moses was very close to God, the Old Testament says uh, that he was God's greatest prophet, Moses reflected God's glory. We read that in Exodus 34, how Moses met with God on Mount Sinai for 40 days, and when he came down the mountain, he had to veil his face because it shone with the reflected glory of God. Here, Jesus is not reflecting glory, he's producing it. Moses was the moon reflecting the light of the sun. Jesus is the sun itself reflecting God's glory, again showing the divinity of Christ. And then one last big pointer here, verse 7, a cloud appeared and enveloped them and a voice came from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And whenever you read in the Bible of a cloud and a voice coming from the cloud, think the presence of the glory of God. We see it in the tabernacle uh, in Exodus 40 when the tabernacle is dedicated. The glory cloud comes down from heaven and settles on the tabernacle and drives the priests out. We see it in 1 Kings 8 when the glory cloud descends on Solomon's temple and drives the priests out. We see it in Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 6 where Isaiah has the vision of the throne room of heaven and there is, it's filled with smoke, it's filled with a cloud. And we see it, of course, here in Mark chapter 9. Glory cloud, voice from the cloud, voice from the cloud, God saying, this is my son, all points to the divinity of Jesus. Um, one last thing in today's devotion. Immediately following the transfiguration, the disciples come off the mountain in verse 14, and they see the disciples with a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them because there is a man whose son is possessed by a demon and the disciples can't cast him out. So you have Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop. They have a mountaintop experience. In fact, maybe this is where we get the phrase mountaintop experience from the Mount of Transfiguration. They're on the highest of highs and then they come down and what happens? They are immediately plunged once again into chaos. Confusion, they feel powerless, they're, you know, they've, just been, they've just seen how Jesus is God and the Pharisees have the temerity to continue to argue with them and dispute with them. And you know they've got to be thinking, what's going on? Why doesn't Jesus just do what he did for us to them and just put an end to it? Just do that little you know, Superman thing again, Jesus. Let your glory shine through and that'll put an end to the argument. And Jesus doesn't do that. So why? And I, I think we can speak about this parabolically. Mountaintop experiences are wonderful. They do happen. We should treasure them when they come. But the vast majority of life is a journey to the cross. Um, we have to walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, God's law is written on our hearts. We've been, we are being transformed from the inside out, but it's not obvious to everybody. And sometimes it causes us to doubt ourselves as well. The majority of life is a journey to the cross. So I, I think it's kind of unhelpful to seek out mountaintop experiences because, oh, all kind of things can happen. I mean, number one, you can develop a, an unhealthy disdain for the regular and the ordinary means of grace in the life of the church, you know, preaching, fellowship, uh, singing, the sacraments, service, prayer, and just want those ecstatic, emotional, powerful experiences. It can also cause you to lie to yourself and, and you're saying, I had this powerful experience when really you didn't and you kind of know you didn't, but you feel like you have to say that. If you chase after mountaintop experiences, it can leave you uh, disappointed or kind of hypocritical in your religious walk. You know, pray for them, be thankful when they come, but realize the vast majority of the Christian life is walking by faith, a journey where we, we take up our crosses as we read about in uh, Mark eight thirty four yesterday, take up our crosses and follow Jesus. Now we'll, uh, again, any questions, comments, uh, whether you're, reading, you're watching this on Facebook or Instagram, you can 
leave those questions and comments uh, as a reply to those posts and, and we'll get back to you. We'd love to be able to do that. And today I want us to pray for some of our, um, some of the leaders in the healthcare community, specifically the infectious disease community, the ep epidemiologists, just pray for wisdom for them and also pray for wisdom for the researchers working in labs around the world trying to uh, find a vaccine for the coronavirus. So let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this day and uh, we thank you that you are a good God who loves his people, loves his people so much that he would send his one and only son, who is God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take on flesh and, and simultaneously and forever be a man, to live the life we should have lived and to on the cross die the death we deserve to die. So we thank you for that. And um, we pray now for the leaders in our, our national health care and infectious disease research community. We pray for Dr. Anthony Fauci, the uh, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. We pray for Dr. Robert Redfield, director of the Centers for Disease Control. And we pray for Dr. Thomas Dobbs, our own state health officer. And we, and we just pray you give them wisdom as they advise the leaders we prayed for yesterday, our, our governmental political leaders that we prayed for yesterday. Give them wisdom to know how to advise the over 300 million people in this country how to live for the next several weeks so that we can most effectively defend, defend um, ourselves and our neighbors against this severe health care threat. And we pray for the medical researchers around the world in labs in university settings and, and other settings around the world, please, Father, speed their work so that they might produce a vaccine. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.